Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thanks for Allah for his blessing and salawat for the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. Good morning ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome everyone to the second keynote session of the first CSTEM International Conference. My name is Elizar and it is an honor to be the moderator for this session. This session will be 45 minutes with 40 minutes presentation and 5 to 10 minute discussion. Later, you can ask questions to the keynote speaker by typing in the chat section. Don't forget to mention your name, country with the question. And also, please make it brief. Before we start the keynote session, let me briefly explain our keynote speaker bio. you. Professor Tom Laurie is a centenary professor at the University of Canberra and director of the STEM Education Research Center, or SERC. Before moving into research, Professor Laurie was a primary school teacher. Over the last 20 years, his research has focused on primary age students Primary age students' use of special reasoning and visual imagery to solve mathematics problem and the role of nature graphics in mathematics assessment. With, with his well-established international profile, Professor Laurie has attracted more than 16 million Australian dollars in nationally competitive research projects, including five ARC discovery grants, a Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade Government Partnership for Development Grant. He is currently leading the Early Learning STEM Australia or ELSA pilot, funded by the Australian Government Department of Education and Training under the National Innovation and Science Agenda. It is exciting that we have Professor Tom Laurie with us today. So without further ado, Please welcome Professor Tom Laurie. The presentation that I'm going to um, describe today is, is to talk about STEM in a different manner than what uh, some people actually envisage the, the conceptualization of the acronym. So as we all know, the acronym for STEM um, stands for um, Science, Technology, Engineering and Mathematics. But the manner in which I want to try and present the material today is to talk to you about how we have to think about STEM in a different way. and, and, and at the work that we do at our center here in Australia, and indeed um, in many countries across the world, is to speak about STEM as a practice. And I'm going to talk about what that means and the, and the way in which that's described as we go through the, the um, keynote today. And of course, at the end of the keynote, I will welcome some um, suggestions from you because um, I'm hoping to learn um, more from you than what you will um, learn from me today. So in, in a normal um, context or situation, we think about STEM, um, as I mentioned before, um, associated with four discipline areas. And those discipline areas are um, both important to, to the whole concept of what STEM is about, but they're also very important in their own right. And if I got you to think about an image of, of a STEM practitioner and, and the way in which STEM professionals would, would engage with their learning, those images would not be um, um, surprising to you. So uh, often we think a scientist works in a laboratory and a, often we think about important technology companies, um, um, many in Asia um, who are some of the most famous in the world but also um, technology companies across the world that we've become accustomed to doing our daily lives with. If we think about an engineer, often we think about them having a hard hat on. Um, sometimes that hat's white, as in this photo, but other times it might well be a yellow hat for safety 
And of course, most people think about mathematics as um, algorithms and procedures and concepts. So that, that would not be of any surprise to you. And, and that connectivity is, is very much about how we try to speak about STEM in a school perspective. But what I wanna to try to do today is challenge you differently um, to think about STEM as a practice. And so the first disruption that we'd like to think about from that perspective is to think about how STEM actually engages in our daily lives. And Professor Data was actually talking about this very well in the last keynote, where she was saying that in order for um, STEM to be important to children and, and to important to individuals, it's actually quite critical that they have some meaning that's, out, what, that's outside their normal environment. Professor talked about how the STEM engagement had to be fun, but she also talked about the manner in which um, that engagement has to be relevant to things that don't just happen in school, but happen outside of school. So if we look at that first image up there, if um, in an agricultural setting, for example, um, all across the world now, um, um, people in agriculture have to engage in STEM very differently than, once, than what they once did. In fact, because of things like climate change and because of, of the fact that um, food has become the most important source now across the world, it means that people have to actually produce food now, not just for themselves, which would have happened 200 or 300 years ago, but people now are producing food for other people who, whom are not able to produce that food. So that, that whole concept is, is changing. If you look about um, the people... Um, particularly in Indonesia, many, many motorbikes in Indonesia. Um, one of the things that I always fondly remember about, about Indonesia, the people who are actually fixing the motorbikes, mechanics, they have to think about STEM very, very differently than what, what they once did. And as computers um, and, and, and as technology changes, the, the way in which a mechanic has to think about fixing an engine now on a, on a, on a motorcycle is much different than what it once was. If you look at um, the, another farming example down below now, um, because of, of biosecurity and because of the importance of trying to have um, um, healthy animals, um, the, the, the structuring of how um, a farm is set up is very different. And you can even take that perspective if you go further, say to somebody who's actually engaging with the technology of developing shoes. Okay, so once upon a time, a shoe didn't have very much technology embedded in it at all, but now people expect a whole range of different things to be able to go through. So the whole framing of what STEM looks like shouldn't just be considered in relation to science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Those four disciplines are very important to STEM and we need those four disciplines to thrive, but we have to think about how they connect in not just an integrated manner, but a much broader sense. And so what I'm advocating in this keynote is that we think about STEM very differently and think about setting the children up for success as, as citizens after school, as well as the important deep learning they need to undertake within a school environment. So what does this actually mean um, come from, from the perspective? If you look up what the, in, in say the Oxford Dictionary, what the definition of practice is, often you will see the definition of a practice is an idea, it's a method, and it's a value, okay? So it normally has three components to it, this notion of a practice. And so what we have done in our team is think about the definition of a practice and embedded that along what sorts of characteristics or attributes are critical um, in terms of a STEM practice. That is, what are the ideas that are common among STEM professions? What are the methods that are common among STEM professions? And what are the values that are common among those STEM professions? And how are those three areas looked upon in, in a manner that can be connected that goes just beyond integrating content? And as I'll, I'll, I'll reiterate many times in this presentation, I'm not suggesting that content is not important. Content is very important and the depth of content is quite critical. But from a STEM perspective, what we should be doing is thinking about the sorts of attributes or components that make up um, a person's important knowledge of STEM. And what we're suggesting is that these ideas are very critical, particular methods and particular values. So if you're a scientist, 
these ideas are always important to you and there's some ideas are important to you if you're a mathematician or if you are in technology or indeed an engineer and the same applies with the methods and the same applies to those values that are really critical having said that if you're a motorbike mechanic or if you're a industrial farmer or agricultural farmer those there's particular methods and particular ideas and particular values that are important to you too now the content that you need for an engineer is very different than the content you need as a as, as a motorcycle mechanic or indeed very different to what you would need if you're an agriculturalist growing grain or, or other or rice or other forms of produce similarly if you're in technology or if you're in mathematics, some of those ideas and, and methods are quite are quite similar, even though the content um, is, it remains different. And so the advocation that we're doing is working through this list. I'm not suggesting for one minute that this list is um, comprehensive or exhaustive, but what I'm doing is just putting this up as a framework to, to give you a sense of what we mean by ideas what we mean by methods and what we mean by values and how those three have to link together in order to create a, a critical way of thinking about STEM. Why does this become important? It becomes important because then we no longer need to change the acronyms. And I'm sure you've heard of many acronyms associated with STEM. A good, a good alternate acronym is STEAM, S-T-E-A-M, the A standing for art or arts. Another um, acronym is STREAM, S-T-R-E-A-M. Another acronym is STEM with an M on it, so S-T-E-M-M. -M. And that last M, the medical people want to put that on, okay? So the medical profession thinks that they need to be important too, and they think that, that the acronym should be S-T-E-M-M. -M. What we're saying is the acronym isn't as important as the practices. And that's because in order to connect STEM to, to real world thinking, you have to get these practices right rather than get the content right. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is unpack that framework, that STEM practice framework, and I'm going to describe that framework across three case studies that we have undertaken in, in, in three different continents. Now, one of the continents is Australia, which would be of no surprise to you because that's where I come from. Um, another continent um, is North America, and in particular, we're looking at a school in Alaska. And another continent is Asia, and it's looking at some of the work that we have undertaken in Indonesia. So what I'm going to do is describe to you these case studies and I'm going to show how the STEM of the practice plays out in how, how these schools have tried to engage with STEM and make sense of STEM learning. Okay, so the first um, case study that I want to talk about is a school in Australia. And it's in a, um, in a um, rural part of Australia, and it's probably about four... Um, four uh, a thousand, oh, sorry, 450 kilometres um, away from the coast. So it's it's what's called inland Australia, um, and it's not it's not in the outback, um, but it's it's in an area that's very very flat, um, and has only about 60,000 people in the city, which of course is very very small population in Indonesia, but it's but it's actually a quite a large population um, for a rural town in Australia. And, the, and, the, and this um, group of, of um, teachers, in this instance in a high school, we're, we're actually in using the acronym STEAM. Okay? So I, I spoke about this acronym before, and that's when sometimes teachers want to actually put art or the arts into their, into their um, program as well. And the reason they do that, in our view, is because we feel that they're thinking about the way in which... Um, learning should take place. So I'm just going to allow you to read um, in Bahasa um, the, the slide there for a moment before I explain a little bit more.
So when we went to visit this school, one of the first things that we noticed was that the school changed the learning environment so there was specific STEAM subjects in the school. So this is very unusual in Australia where a high school um, had the courage to actually um, establish a pathway for students to learn about STEM in a manner that was connected across the disciplines. So um, as, as it is the case in Indonesia and as it is the case in Malaysia, there actually is not a STEAM curriculum or a STEAM syllabus that's approved by the national body. So there's no cup of parton in Indonesia, for example, where, where you have a syllabus that is actually called STEM. You have a syllabus that's about mathematics, there's a syllabus for science, there's a syllabus um, for technology, um, but there certainly isn't one actually for engineering either. But this school decided that they would actually reframe some of their learning activities. And what they did was encourage the children to develop in what's called a design and make manner um, to develop learning activities. And those learning activities were um, connected to and associated with some real world problems. And so the teachers pose real world problems to the children and they pose these complex activities the children needed to solve and they were related to particular real life um, um, experiences. So that, that was, that's one way of, of a group um, thinking about and framing their work. And so um, the second um, case study um, is in a very, very different place. And this is actually in Alaska. And so this is um, 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 right at the, um, the top of North America. And as you might know, um, a, in a very, very different climate to that of rural Australia and indeed in a very different and much more extreme climate to that that you experience in Indonesia. So this school, it actually um, is a, in a place called Anchorage and it was approximately the same size of students as what was in Australia. Okay, so, give, so, so approximately the same amount of um, students um, that were engaged in this, in this community as, as, as the, that of, the, of that um, area that I was describing in Australia. So just for a moment, um, in Bahasa again, I'll just allow you to re re uh, read that slide. So um, because um, climate change is a, um, a real issue all over the world, but it's, it's particularly an issue in Alaska because of um, melting ice caps, children in, in Alaska are encouraged to think about um, climate change um, in, in very complex ways. And what's interesting, um, as you can see by the quote from the um, school district leader, they felt that STEM had to go beyond this idea of content. And they felt that was a very important way of trying to develop an understanding of, of um, the work that they're engaging with and the way in which children learn. And they actually mentioned many times in our case study that they were trying to move away from, from content-driven work in order for children to get inside complex ideas. And as you can see from the description there, they were using um, the local environment and, 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 and thinking about the way in which that environment changed as, as, as they turned into winter, the climate changes dramatically much more dramatic climate changes than what you would experience in Indonesia. And so as a, as a result, waterways became ice um, and, and those waterways weren't freezing over as much as what they once were. And so the children were having to do some, were having to do quite complex navigating around maps and reading about pathways of water, um, measuring the, the temperature of the water and noticing when that water temperature was changing over time and developing some relatively sophisticated experiments, even though they're only very young children, 
um, um, to describe the way in which um, their world was connected. And, and, the, and the beauty of this case study was to demonstrate some of the affordances that STEM has in, in encouraging communities to get together. Because what this, um, what this school did in Anchorage was encourage community leaders to come in talk to the children about their occupations and some of the ways that they in part of their employment are thinking about really serious stem ideas and that provided children with um, some motivation and also some really important insights into into the way in which they could tackle and solve some of the problems they were undertaking um, the next case study is, um, is in indonesia um, in in uh, West Nusa Tenggara, uh, which is a province um, um, that uh, my team and I are both very fond of and we have visited regularly. I think I've actually been to NTB 17 times. So um, um, I feel like it's my second home and um, I'm very inspired by the um, communities um, in NTB and incredibly inspired also um, by the teachers and the and, and the children. Um, the gurus there are amazing and they've um, taught us a great deal. But this, this school that we visited in particular um, really changed our mind about how STEM could be enacted and operated um, from, a, from a school perspective. So just for a minute, I'll, I'll allow you to read the slide. Now, the vice chairman of the school was a, a very inspirational person and um, he had um, quite an entrepreneurial bent to his thinking and, and his view was that the community and the school should work together very closely and that, and that part of um, what they should be able to do is actually provide resources um, for both the school and the community as part of their engagement um, with the school learning. And so he, for example, was able to get philanthropic money um, to come into the school from places um, such as Sweden and Norway, um, um, very wealthy countries who were inspired by the learning program that was taking place um, in, in the school within the province. Now, um, the, the, um, the school um, um, was um, focused on um, a whole range of really important ideas and concepts but, and I'll speak about this, you know, um, this school in more detail in a moment because of the three case studies, I want to talk about one in detail. And of course, the one that I'm sure you'll be most interested in is, is the um, Indonesian one. Okay, so what is, is critical um, about these three case studies is that they all um, enacted and they all um, considered really importantly um, the relationship between ideas, methods, and values. And what we did was that we looked at the we looked at these components in, in each different site. And if you can if you can see there from the um, bolded um, the bolded text, that particular school focused on that um, um, component of the STEM practice more than the other two. Now, this is not to suggest that they weren't all doing ideas, methods and values as part of their STEM practice units. It's just to highlight the fact that each school was, was able to take one of those components and make it a really critical component. So the, um, the um, Islamic boarding school in NTB, they were enacting really important STEM ideas, really important STEM methods, and really important STEM values. But the ones that were the central point of their STEM engagement was the values. And so what they were fostering more than anything else was inspiring the children to be creative and persistent and to undertake teamwork and to think creatively and to have a great deal of integrity 
um, as part of the work that they were un undertaking and doing. So that was very, very critical. In Australia, by contrast, um, that school, that high school, was focusing much more on the methods. The ideas and the values were important, but they were really focusing on the, the actual processes that take place, those STEM processes that are really critical that, that, that go across and connect differently um, to, to the approaches that you take across the content areas. So they were really encouraging the children to generate ideas and to think critically and to decipher information through encoding and decoding and to, and to be able to process multiple forms of information in order to, in order to solve and, and react to um, complex problems. The case study in, in Anchorage, by contrast, because they were focusing on what sometimes is called a wicked problem or a very complex problem, they were fo they, their main idea that, that they framed around their STEM unit was this, uh, this, this notion of what's, what are the really important ideas among the practice. So they were, unsurprisingly, um, from the description I said to you, were focusing on problem finding, exploring and challenging, um, finding and validating evidence, and questioning and so that evidence i spoke about before was when they were actually taking um taking measurements of um the, the the sea temperature and the temperature of the lakes and they were trying to make predictions and they were basing that on a whole lot of evidence that they had found about previous years and seeing how the changes how the temperature had risen and so on so they were actually doing things in a very different way but as a combination what you'll see from the from this slide is that those ideas and methods and values were enacted quite differently across these case studies. Okay, so um, the, the 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 school that I'm going to focus a little bit more on now and provide a little bit more detail to is um, is the Islamic boarding school in um, in TB. And so so remembering um, that the 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 ideas that, that that they were really focusing on methods and and those really really important values um, which of course um, as you know are a really important feature of the indonesian curriculum and so so this whole idea of integrity and this whole idea of value is quite critical to indonesian culture and they were really manifesting that really well in the way they undertook their work okay so i'm just going to um, let you read this slide for a moment to, to um, take note of where we're up to have a uh, five to seven minutes okay thank you so so from from the perspective of of, of the content from what the school was doing um, they were focusing um, um, so, so they were ut utilizing technology a great deal in the way in which they in the way in which they investigated their stem their stem ideas their stem methods and their stem values but the priorities that they were doing um, included um, entrepreneurial things where the school were actually generating and making money um, to support both the school and the community um, and and this was undertaken in ways where the children actually um, became um, there, were, there was a blurring of the lines if you like a blurring between um, the, the manner in which the children um, um, were doing school work and they were doing community work and sometimes the children didn't see the difference between the two and I think that's something that um, as from an educator perspective, we know we're doing a good program if the children don't realise they're doing schoolwork, if they realise they're actually doing um, work that's important for the community. And so, so these, these ideas of um, they had extensive tree planting programs, they actually had a catfish farm that, and they were, they were producing and they're cultivating mushrooms and they're actually selling some of their produce. And, this, and, the, and the, um, from a sustainability perspective, the uh, students were developing a... Um, a, a, a way of um, cleaning up the neighbourhood because it was um, it was in need of repair. And they're actually turning a whole lot of a whole lot of rubbish into recycled materials. Incredibly inspiring. 
Um, so I'm just going to show um, some um, a few photos now that will give you a sense of the, what the children were doing as part of that connectivity. You can see the, um, the catfish farm there and you can see the little shop that they had um, and you can see some of the some of the sustainability methods they were undertaking um, in order to in order to clean the community up. All of this embedded into their STEM program. Okay, so um, so just um, from for a moment now, um, from the uh, the vice chairman who had some really good insights. I think some of these, some of his um, inspirational words um, are important to consider. Okay, so so that 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 the framing of that work um, is is positioned around, um, I guess, the the passion and the ideas of the school leaders. But what they were able to do is instill that passion and that vision um, into the into the work and the practice of the children undertook. Okay, so um, how do we do this, and why is this important for for the content in which we undertake? So. Um, the work that we do, the work that we do um, as, as, as part of our um, engagement and part of our scientific program is to look at um, a really important way of thinking and, and getting that to be promoted around STEM. And in the previous keynote, um, the professor was talking about logical reasoning. Um, well, what interestingly, what we do, we focus a lot of our work on spatial reasoning. And so, so the work that we undertake and the work that we engage with children is around this really important way of thinking. It's critical because um, this spatial reasoning um, is malleable. That means it can be taught really quickly. And what's important is this spatial reasoning is the biggest predictor of a person having success in a STEM in a STEM subject in the STEM area. It's, it's critical for mathematics, but it's also critical to other STEM subjects. And so, if you look at it from a, um, an Indonesian perspective, these four images here. Um, uh, 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 talk, looking at um, particularly two of them, are looking at navigation for expecting for. Um, so, if you're having to navigate as part of your job, your spatial reasoning is really critical. If you're actually developing um, a beautiful batik, um, you have to have really good spatial reasoning in order to understand the, the patterning and all to uh, able to understand that patterning. So, spatial reasoning is important for for, for your daily um, performances in life, but it's also important for this improvement. Okay. And so, um, for example, you know, if you're driving around, um, uh, particularly in busy streets, for example, um, in Jakarta, um, you can get lost very easily if, you, if your spatial reasoning skills are not good because you can be diverted off into, a, into one area with lots of one-way streets um, in, in Jakarta. And if you get stuck in the wrong street, you can be sometimes 20 kilometres away before you can actually turn around. So these sorts of decision-making you have to be able to do on the spot is, is routine for a person who lives in Jakarta. But for a person who lives in another province, going into Jakarta can be a very um, challenging thing. Um, so, so what we do as part of our work is, is um, develop intervention programs that actually promote this STEM thinking. And the best way to do to promote this STEM thinking is through what's, what we call the spatial reasoning. And so I'm, I understand I've only got a little bit of time left. So I just want to I just want to talk about um, the way in which those three case studies can be can be linked to this area of spatial reasoning. I've mentioned along the way that it's very important not to um, not to um, um, disconnect or take away the content um, when you do a STEM program. Even though I said that the content isn't the most important part of developing a STEM program, it's the practice. But the way in which you can actually get the content to actually work and to sing along, um, and, and, and as one of the um, facilitators said the other day, make things beautiful is through, is through developing these spatial reasoning skills. So what we do with, our, with the children that we're working with is we develop these intervention programs that are based on STEM, based on those sorts of um, values, ideas, and methods that you saw before that I've presented to you, but we focus on these spatial skills to develop those, those ideas. And here's just an example um, of, of three of the um, intervention programs we have undertaken 
um, that demonstrate um, transfer to mathematics. So what I mean by that is our intervention programs do not teach mathematics. And in fact, when the when the um, gurus um, um, teach teach the um, the, the, the um, intervention programs, they don't teach mathematics at all. But as you can see from these three graphs, the mathematics improves um, at a significant rate. And in fact, in some of our programs at a dramatic rate um, as part of the development of the spatial reasoning. So as, this, as the children's spatial reasoning goes up, okay, their mathematics goes up even higher in every instance. So there's this connectivity for, between spatial reasoning and these in the STEM areas critical but we've been able to demonstrate that, that by developing these programs, the children's STEM knowledge, in this instance, their mathematics improves. So their mathematics performance improves greatly by connecting and moving forward into these areas. So um, I think that um, um, uh, I'm running out of a bit of time now. Um, so, so I just want to um, finish on one, on one slide and then I'll... Um, um, open up to some, some questions and comments and, and Dr. Siddhi Padahudan might help me actually with some of the responses I make if, if need be from, from this component. So um, as, as a summary, STEM is, shouldn't just be about the four content areas of science, technology, engineering and mathematics. We should think about STEM as a practice and those practices are associated with particular um, ideas, particular methods and particular values that are really critical to the work that's undertaken. And what I did was I demonstrated through three different case studies how these ideas and these methods and these values in schools in different parts of the world can actually be connected together in order to promote a really important STEM program, which I hope sits well with the, um, with, with the theme of this conference. Um, but beside that, what I'm saying is if you want to get at the content at the same time, and that it is, if you want to actually develop these methods, ideas and values, but also improve the children's content knowledge, the best way to do that is to enact that through, through developing the children's spatial reasoning skills for two reasons. Um, the spatial reasoning improves the content. And as I demonstrated from the previous slide, that the content improves dramatically um, if, if you actually address these spatial skills. But also, um, this spatial thinking actually promotes STEM. So, so if you like, the spatial thinking does two really important things. It develops, develops the content knowledge and the performance of the content knowledge, but at the same time, it sets the children up well in order to go into a STEM profession into the future because there's such a strong connection between this spatial thinking and it promotes STEM. So much so that, that the biggest contributor to a person, for example, becoming an engineer is their spatial reasoning ability. That is, if they have strong spatial reasoning ability, it's much more likely that they'll move into a STEM profession. Okay, so I'll, I'll finish the, um, the presentation on this slide because I think it's a good way to um, finish that component of it. I think I've about exhausted my time. And now I'll, um, I'll hand back over um, to Dr. Elezi um, to, to, to manage the next part. Can, uh, Professor Tom Laurie. Uh, I think I want to highlight uh, one very interesting thing about the presentation. Uh, I'm glad that you mentioned something about STEM practice and how diverse it is in terms of the three cases that you presented for us. Uh, now I realize how a STEM practice doesn't have to be uniform. It can be very diverse depending on what schools actually want to emphasize. All right, then I'm sure that uh, some of you have a question uh, for Professor Tom Laurie. Please uh, type in the chat section. All right, so we have uh, one question for Dr. Didi Sugang Pambudi. Uh, his question is, would you explain to us how to improve the PISA results of Indonesian results? Oh, very important <laughs> question. <laughs> so please, Professor Lomri. <laughs> so, um, well, um, in interestingly, um, um, and, and uh, Dr. Siddi can help you if she wants, but um, the to be honest, the, the best way to improve the, um, the children's PISA results is to actually improve their spatial reasoning <laughs> because um, the, the, um, the pre and post test um, work that we actually do to measure 
to measure children's performance change over time from our spatial reasoning program is with PISA-like test items. That is, we give the children PISA-like test items. Uh, we don't teach them any of those test items. We don't teach to a test. We don't even give them any content related to that. All we do is, is develop our intervention programs and we've found substantially that their, um, the children's um, spatial reasoning improves. And we've been, in the past, we've worked with the World Bank in Indonesia um, to, de to develop some programs that have um, a key component for spatial reasoning in that. And um, one of the projects that um, we did with um, the Department of um, um, DFAT in Australia Department um, working with um, the communities in um, NTB, but also in, in um, the education directorate in um, Jakarta was to actually promote um, some from spatial reasoning, actually improving teachers' spatial reasoning skills, which can also help help with children's performance. Professor Tamalori, so we, we go to the second question. Uh, this is from Tias Andromeda. Uh, his, uh, her question is how to measure the grade of successful of STEM implementation and how long does the measurement might take? I'm sorry, can you, can you just repeat that uh, question again? Because I was trying to read I the think, chat. Yeah, I sorry. Think question, her question is how to measure the successfulness of STEM implementation. Um, so, I'm, I'm hope I'm answering this question correctly. But um, so we, we've we've tried to develop um, a series of fidelity measures that we provide to the teachers that allow allow them to take um, to, to to try and track um, um, the the particular um, methods, ideas, and values that they're actually engaging with because. What you'll notice from the three case studies, um, and it was a point that you raised um, um, earlier, was that there's a diverse uh, an approach or a diverse way of actually um, enacting these um, STEM, and, and it can work very, very well by um, undertaking this in very different ways. Nevertheless, um, it's quite it's quite critical um, that that we actually have a, um, some fidelity measures or, or really good ways of checking what's happening. So that so that teachers can take account of what they're doing. So um, sometimes we call it explicit teaching, or, and sometimes we call it um, um, uh, clever planning. But but the or, or, or um, the, but that planning of that work needs to take place as well, so that the creativity and all of that doesn't run off in, onto different directions that the teacher can't get back to. So I think it's a really um, um, powerful question that was posed because it's this idea that you can that um, we have to be careful not to become too generic and not to, sp to sp span our work out in such ways that it doesn't allow for the teacher to really have some explicit ways of actually developing the children's um, confidence um, and their, and, and, but also their performance and also the, the integrity of, of all the work they're undertaking. Uh, right, thank you. Thank you, Professor Tom Lowry. I'm sure that some of the other audience might have some other question, but unfortunately we can't actually cover those questions uh, because of the time limit. So uh, this is the end of our keynote session. Something that I want to highlight before we end the session is that when we, when we think about STEM uh, practices, we have to uh, think of how to connect the science, uh, technology, engineering and mathematics in a broader sense. So uh, I would like to thank the audience for the enthusiasm and attention during the session. And many thanks for Professor Tamulori uh, for uh, being here today. Uh, hopefully, uh, you can be in our chair in the future when pandemic is actually over. So uh, I've, I've I promised Professor Lama that I will come one day. <laughs> <laughs> so I will come. <laughs> yes, please come. So we would love to have you here in person. <laughs> So uh, before okay, we uh, end this session, I would like to remind everyone that the next session will be the keynote session by Associate Professor Rachel Sheffield from Curtin University. So please stay tuned. And for now, I would like to say goodbye. Uh, I might see some of you again in the parallel session later on. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.